so thank you all for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I understand that some of you are having simultaneous translation. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Everything good? And the translator at the back, okay. If you want me to stop, throw something at me, okay? All right, so I'm going to be talking about approaches to a cure for HIV. Um, there are many things that we disagree on in the field of HIV cure, but there, there's one thing that we do agree on, and it pertains to the HIV reservoir. What we agree on is this. As you all know, when somebody gets infected with HIV, virus load peaks in acute infection, comes down to a set point, you put people on therapy, and virus goes below the level of detection of the assay. And the thing that we agree on is that when you stop therapy, pretty much every single time, virus comes back in two to four weeks. Okay, you could, you could write this into the Bible and it would be accepted by everybody. Always comes back in two to four weeks. So antiretroviral therapy, ART, is not going to be a cure for HIV. And the reason is because of the HIV reservoir. These are cells that harbor replication competent virus that rekindle HIV replication and transmission in the absence of combination ART, antiretroviral therapy. Now, this reservoir, let's talk about the reservoir a little bit. You all know this stuff. In acute infection, you have productively infected cells that make virus. Effective ART suppresses all of that and you're left with a few quiescently infected T cells that are resting, <coughs> are not making virus, but contain an HIV genome. Now these cells can live forever, or they can divide, carrying that HIV genome with them, but not actually making any virus. And when you stop ART, the HIV rebounds from those latently infected cells. So what we want to do with a cure is to get rid of this quiescently infected T cell or suppress it. So the problem that, 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 that we're up against are these quiescent HIV-infected cells that persist indefinitely on ART. So how are we going to cure HIV-infected people? Well, I, I'm not going to go into this, but let's accept that there are mul multiple mechanisms that account for HIV persistence. And the unifying theme of any cure approach is to find and diminish the size of the HIV reservoir. And these are some of the approaches that I'm going to be talking about. We can reduce seeding of the latent pool with early or more ART. We can reverse latency. That's called shock and kill. You've probably heard of that. We can increase HIV-specific immune function with vaccines or immunotherapy. <clears throat> we can use gene therapy to target the virus and the host and disable certain factors or we can perform allogeneic stem cell transplantation. But, or and, because there are multiple mechanisms to account for persistence, and I'm going to say this here, and I'm going to say this at the end, what's important to consider is that combination approaches may be necessary. So, first of all, some definitions. What is an HIV cure? Well, strictly speaking, an HIV cure is the total removal of all replication competent HIV from an infected individual. Now, if you look at the key outcomes in surveys in the community of HIV infected people, this is important because it leaves them with no residual stigma. Thank you. I've got two. Is that water or vodka? <laughs> Kuiper in there. I'm good. Kuiper in here. Um, it leaves them with no residual stigma, and that's important to them. However, an absolute cure is difficult to achieve and impossible, if you think about it, to prove. <clears throat> now, we have cured uh, people, one person to be exact, and this is Timothy Ray Brown. I'm sure you've all heard of him. He received a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation from a donor whose cells were resistant to infection because of CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. And he's doing very well off antiretroviral drugs for more than 10 years. He has no replication competent HIV, 
We have his cells in our freezer. We can't find any virus. But even though this procedure works, I'm sure you'll all agree with me, that it's highly unlikely that it will ever translate into an accessible approach. You're not going to perform stem cell transplantations on people in Africa, for example, who don't have access to facilities. And these kind of procedures have a rather high morbidity and mortality. And this problem is brought even more to the fore by the experience of the Boston patients. Now, they had almost exactly the same thing. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but from donors whose cells were susceptible to infection. And what you can see is that despite a 1,000 to 10,000 fold reduction in the size of the HIV reservoir, eventually, and here it took eight months, eventually, virus rebounded off ART. Now, the mathematical modelers will tell us that in order to achieve a lasting cure, the latent reservoir will have to be depleted more than 100,000 fold. So this is mathematics, and I don't trust mathematics, because what we know is that for virus to recrudesce, all you need is a single replication competent virus. So if you reduce it 100,000 fold and there's one virus left, that virus will come back. Look at this individual who received post-exposure prophylaxis in about day one after exposure. And it resulted in no detectable reservoir. In fact, the reservoir size <coughs> was estimated to be about 100 replication competent virions. So they kept him on therapy for a while, and then they stopped therapy. And then eight months later, a single virus reemerged and was responsible for a recrudescent infection, okay? The virus just keeps coming back. There are dozens of cases of very low reservoir states where the virus eventually rebounded off ART. So let's change the, re the, the, the definition a little bit and talk about what is HIV remission. We stole this concept from the field of, uh, of cancer treatment, and I think it's a very good one. Remission is the durable control of the residual reservoir of ART, and importantly, no transmission of that HIV to other people. But the question remains, is remission an improvement over long-term ART? Well, it has the potential to reduce stigma, and certainly the side effects of ART, and it has the potential to reduce inflammation-related complications that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So, the first approach, early antiretroviral therapy. So here's a picture of people followed, which is the size of their reservoirs, from acute infection. At about the time that HIV RNA becomes detectable, so that's here, the reservoir size begins to decrease, to, sorry, to increase dramatically, follow this blue line, with a hundredfold increase over the next two weeks such that the reservoir is largely established by week four of infection, okay? Four weeks, you've established your reservoir. Now, if you look at these red lines, people who are put on ART, it's clear that, clear that early ART can significantly reduce the size of the reservoir. And that's what I'm showing you here. That's the size of the reservoir, and if you treat within two weeks, it's very low. Two to four weeks, it's a little bit higher. In the chronic phase, it's a lot higher. So early ART, very early ART, reduces the reservoir size. But what about how many days to virus recrudescence if you stop therapy? So if you treat people in FIBIG stage one, recrudescence occurs at a median of 26 days after therapy interruption. If you treat them in stage three to four, 22 days chronic 14 days. So these are significant differences, right? <clears throat> However, it might be significant for the virus, but it's not clinically significant delay for the individual who's infected with HIV. <clears throat> so we're up against a wall here. We're up against a time limit. And if we wanted to treat any earlier, we would be in the realms of pre-exposure prophylaxis. Okay? All right. Shock and kill. Now, you've all heard of this. The reason that you've heard of it 
is not because it works, it's because people have published lots of papers about it. So you can already understand how I feel about this approach. Let's define it first of all. So the aim is to take a drug called a latency reversing agent, or LRA, and to reactivate HIV transcription in infected cells. That's called the shock. And so the infected cell produces virus. And then either the virus kills the cell or the immune system kills the cell. Shock and kill. And you do this under cover of antiretroviral therapy to stop new infection. There are many LRAs that are in clinical trials. Those are the ones that I've underlined. And there are new pathways of cellular activation which are being explored. So what about the results of the clinical trials? Well, there are numerous LRAs that have been identified, and they're in studies in vitro with cell lines and primary T cells. Here is a graph showing T cell stimulation. The red line here is maximal T cell stimulation, because that's what you want to do with these drugs, of LRAs on their own, or LRAs in combination. And the problem is that relative to maximal T cell activation, Few LRAs work very well ex vivo with cells from HIV positive people. They just don't reactivate much HIV. And in clinical trials, <coughs> there is evidence for increased, right, increase in cell associated and plasma HIV RNA. No reduction in the reservoir yet demonstrated. And I'm showing you here the results of five recent clinical trials. And here are measures of the HIV reservoir, cell-associated virus RNA, plasma RNA, and DNA. And what you would like to see are the arrows going down, right? Reduction in the size of the reservoir. But all you see is the arrows going up or straight across. So there are many clinical trials, but none eliminate latently infected cells. Well, why is this? Well, remember that the approach is called shock and kill. You want to reactivate the virus with your LRA, and then you want to clear the infected cells. Well, will the virus kill the infected cells? Well, there's good data to show that the virus really uh, doesn't have a very good cytopathic effect. Well, can the immune system help? Well, it should, but remember, HIV mutates, and it mutates away from the immune system to escape the immune response. Well, could you use therapeutic vaccines well, in therapeutic vaccines, you can certainly expand T cells. However, these T cells do not recognize these escaped, mutated HIV epitopes. So since we're on the subject of therapeutic vaccines, let's talk about them for a moment. There have been almost 100 clinical trials completed over two decades with DNA-based vaccines, RNA-based vaccines, peptide-based, different viral vectors, dendritic cell-based vaccines. And these vaccines, the papers report, are safe and generally immunogenic. Now, you all know what it means, right, when the title of a paper says, blah, 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 therapy is safe and immunogenic, right? It means it doesn't work. <laughs> so these studies, very safe, immunogenic, but really of no benefit in most studies and modest debatable benefit in a few studies. However, despite these failures, the therapeutic vaccine field is alive and well. These are, you don't have to read any of this because they didn't work. These are recently completed ones and these are ongoing ones. Well, why do therapeutic vaccines not work? Well, they could be weak or ineffective because of pre-existing immunodominant responses that aren't recognized. As I mentioned, CTL epitope escape. Well, the vaccines may just be crappy. You know, they're, they're not very potent vaccines. There's a lot of inflammation and immune dysfunction in HIV infection. There's a high virus burden. That's a, that's a difficult task for an immune system to do. And if the immune system was up to it in the first place, well, you wouldn't have a chronic persistent infection. And of course, there are immune privileged tissue sanctuaries. I really think that interventions that address only a single barrier to efficacy are unlikely to work. So this is the theme of combinations. Well, what about combinations, right? 
maybe you could combine an LRA, keratin LRA, with a vaccine or another modality that we might uh, consider and I'll be talking about in a second. So here's a combination LRA vaccine study, 20 people who were immunized on therapy, antiretroviral therapy, and after the immunization, they were given romidepsin, that's a latency reversing agent that activates CD4 T cell, and then antiretroviral therapy was stopped. So there was no change in integrated DNA during this or infectious virus, but there was a significant decline in total HIV DNA, right? So it's looking good. What happens when you stop therapy? Two to four weeks, all the virus came back in everyone, made no difference. Here's a more recent study where people were started on antiretroviral therapy very, very early in acute infection. And at the same time, they were given a vaccination. Doesn't matter about the details. And then a bit later on, they were given more vaccination with romidepsin, this LRA. Then therapy was stopped. So eight individuals out of the 13 refrudesc, two to four weeks. Five individuals had HIV control. And that's the last picture that anyone has ever seen, um, because apparently after around 24 weeks, they all lost control of, of the virus and the virus recrudesced and they had to resume ARP. So have I depressed everybody here? Yeah, it's not looking good, is it? Um, but I don't want you to go home this evening and say to your loved ones, I went to this talk in the morning and it was just horrible, this this scientist came over from the United States and he was just really depressing. Um, I don't want that to happen. Um, and whenever you mention immunotherapy to people these days, right, we smile, the sun comes out. Immunotherapy, for me, you know, I was one of the people years ago who said immunotherapy is never going to work in cancer. Most people said that. And the immunotherapy people always had like the last session on Sunday afternoon of the conference and there were only five people in that session and those five people were the speakers in that session. Right? And immunotherapy has revolutionized things. It's miraculous. So what about applying immunotherapy to HIV cure? And it's early days. So this is an exhausted T cell. How do we know it's exhausted? Because it's expressing an immune checkpoint marker, PD-1. And PD-1 binds to PDL1, its ligand, on a target cell. <coughs> and that target cell could be a cancer cell, could be an HIV infected cell, it doesn't matter. And this interaction sends a signal and blocks the T cell receptor from signaling, so it can't recognize its target cell. All right? So what you want to do with immunotherapy is to take an antibody and block that interaction. If you block that interaction, the T cell can recognize its target cell and kill the target cell, an HIV infected cell or a cancer cell. And there are monoclonal antibodies to PD-1, PDL-1, and CTLA-4 for melanoma, lung, and bladder cancer, which have now been licensed, and they're working, and they're remarkable. And it was shown that ex vivo blockade in this situation, this situation, can actually enhance HIV-specific T cell responses against infected target cells. There's another thing that's attractive about immune checkpoint blockade, because it can act as an LRA, a latency-reversing agent. So here's an HIV-infected cell with a checkpoint uh, marker on it. And what's been found, these are the papers, is that HIV is actually enriched in cells that express checkpoint markers. The reason is that these checkpoint markers turn this into quiescent cells, so the cell shuts down, so the HIV becomes quiescent, and the cell is not recognizable to the immune system. So if you take a antibody against this, you block it, what happens is that the cell wakes up, and it starts making HIV, and that cell becomes recognizable to the immune system that has also been woken up by this antibody to the checkpoint marker here. So immune checkpoint blockade could not only reinvigorate the CDH T cell, but it could also wake up this T cell from latency. 
And there is indeed ex vivo and in vivo evidence for LRA activity of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4. So I've mentioned PDL1, PD-1, CTLA-4. Those are the ones that you've heard of because drugs are being licensed against them. But there are many other antibodies to immune checkpoints, both inhibitory receptors and activating receptors, and we're just at the beginning of this adventure. So, what about in vivo activity of anti-PD-1 alone? There are a bunch of studies, very, very recently published, some not even published yet. I'm gonna go through those briefly with you now. This study of anti-PD-1 showed that you had an increase in the size of the reservoir. So it's not what we really want, we want a decrease, but it shows that the reservoir is waking up. This study, which is not published yet, um, from Romantin and Chaumont and colleagues, show a reduction in DNA and RNA, HIV DNA and RNA after PD-1. So you get a reduction in the size of the reservoir. That looks pretty good. This therapy from a French group shows that the size of the reservoir decreases. Very interesting. And this paper, which came out last month, three patients, these are all patients, these are people with malignancies, I should say, that here you see temporary transient increases in the size of the reservoir when PD-1 is given, so LRA activity going up. Nothing happened in this person, and here we got a drop in the size of the reservoir. So it's inconsistent. PD-1 alone may be insufficient for consistent latency reversal, but there are hints, there are hints that there may be a beneficial effect here. And what we need is a larger prospective cohort to better understand the effects. And as you can imagine, there are a number of trials underway. These are the trials in these countries recruiting these many people in individuals who are HIV infected and have malignancies. And so the treatment is for the malignancy, but we're seeing the effect on HIV reservoir as well. So trials are underway in HIV positive people with malignancies. <clears throat> And further trials have been approved and will start in about two years' time in HIV-positive people who have no malignancies. So I'm excited about this. Now we come to gene therapy. Now, you've heard of, of gene therapy. Um, it's basically uh, it's an attempt to deliver a therapeutic agent to a cell using a gene. So in the case of HIV, what's that therapeutic agent? <clears throat> well. You could provide something to inhibit or kill HIV. You could remove something that HIV needs, like CCR5. <clears throat> and the lesson that we learned from the Berlin and the Boston patients that I talked about earlier on is that you, you need to remove both the virus and the target cell. Remember, the, the Boston patient who's okay, we got rid of his HIV with chemotherapy, and we got rid of his CCR5 with the donor's cells. So you need, to relieve, you need to remove both the virus and the target cell. So I'm gonna give you an example of a, of a study that's underway with nuclease-based gene therapy that targets CCR5. So here's an HIV-infected individual. Um, cells are removed and they're put into culture in flux and they are treated with an adenovirus vector that expresses a zinc finger nuclease. This is an enzyme that is specific for the CCR5 region of the human genome, and it cuts it out and disables it. So the cells become CCR5 negative. These cells are then formulated and reinfused. Now, the nice thing about this approach is that it's minimally invasive, no severe adverse events. It's much more accessible than hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and it's autologous. So there's no need for compatible donors and no risk of graft versus host disease. Um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but I'll go through it briefly. So this is trial of aviremic on therapy, HIV positive people. And a single infusion of CCR5 modified CD4 T cells, like I've just described to you, <clears throat> those persist long term in vivo. All the participants had a reduction in the size of the HIV reservoir over three years. I'm showing you the reduction here. And the kinetics of this reduction suggest that it was replacement of infected cells over time with new CCR5 modified cells that accounted for this reduction reservoir size. 
And then a therapy interruption was performed at six weeks after the infusion. And there was a reduction in plasma virus load set point that correlated with the number of CCR5 modified cells that remained in the individual. That's pretty nice data. This came out again um, about three months ago. And it's a trial in macaques, monkeys, infected with a chimeric simian human immunodeficiency virus with autologous CCR5 gene edited cells. And they found only 5% engraftment, so it's not a lot, but they found that these gene edited cells persisted and were readily detectable in tissue, very important. And they found that tissue associated virus DNA and RNA levels was significantly re reduced and that the size of the active reservoir so, so uh, infection competent virions in the periphery was um, verily impacted, but in most animals it went down. So this is very exciting news. And let's end with this topic, broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV envelope. So what about the clinical use of HIV specific antibodies? Well, you can imagine that you can use HIV specific antibodies in two situations. One is to prevent infection, and the other one is to treat infection. And they are being used in both of those situations. If you want to prevent acquisition of infection, you might do this in breastfeeding infants, high-risk young adults, discordant couples, or high-risk MSM populations. And it's probably kind of easy in that situation, easy to block transmission, because there's a bottleneck in transmission, and you only have to inhibit a few viruses. To treat with antibodies is considerably more difficult because you have to deal with <coughs> not only a much greater amount of virus, but a much greater amount of virus diversity. The situations you might do this in are, for example, reducing viremia in acute infection, during treatment interruption, in maintenance therapy, perhaps with long-acting antiretroviral drugs. And there's a potential to reduce the HIV reservoir size, and that's our cure. How would it work? Well, you could block virus entry into cells by binding virus in the blood, or you could kill infected cells by binding to envelopes on the surface of infected cells. So this is a picture of the HIV envelope, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it really does look like this, and it really has these colors. Um, these are the areas of the envelope that these antibodies target. These are the names of the antibodies, and the ones that are in red are the ones that are currently in clinical trials. So here is a graph showing the potency and the breadth of broadly neutralizing antibodies specific for HIV N. Potency increases in that direction. Breadth of coverage, so how many different envelopes the antibody recognizes, increases if you go up. These are some of the antibodies that the field has produced. And this is where we are now roughly with the antibodies in clinical trials. This antibody is called VRC07. Where we would like to be is an antibody here, extremely potent and with very high breadth. This was a trial of one of our antibodies, VRC01, a single infusion into viremic people. And this is virus uh, change in virus load days after infusion of the antibody, and there are three patterns that you can see. Profound and maintained suppression, transient suppression, and no suppression at all. So why are there these three patterns? Here I'm showing you a graph of the sensitivity to the antibody of the viruses in these individuals before therapy was started, and these are the two people, number 21 and number 26, who did not respond to the broadly neutralizing antibody. And what you can see is that the non-responders had virus that was resistant to the antibody before infusion of the antibody, all right? And there are very similar results in human trials of other antibodies. So if your virus is not sensitive to the antibody, you're not gonna respond. It's just like if you have a virus that has uh, uh, some kind of uh, drug escape mutation. Same thing. Here are the results of two phase one trials completed recently of the same antibody, VRCO1, 
which was given during an analytic therapy interruption. This study here, these are the days after therapy interruption, you can see virus coming back. The majority rebounded by week five, even with high plasma levels of the antibody. There was a modest delay in virus rebound compared to historical controls, and similar findings have been found with another antibody in a similar clinical trial. So it's a little bit encouraging, but it's not great. But remember, this is monotherapy. We're not going to expect it to work perfectly um, first go. This is like AZT on its own. So what are we going to look for in a second generation monoclonal antibody product? Well, we want tenfold more potent antibodies. We want them to cover all of virus diversity because this prevents the escape that we saw in the clinical trials I just showed you. We'd like it to be given by a subcutaneous injection once every six months versus an IV infusion every two months. And we want the cost to be comparable to the current ARVs. So are we anywhere close to these requirements? Well, let's talk about potency and breadth. Here are a bunch of antibodies. These are their names. They are more potent as they go down the scale. And up here is the breadth of neutralization. So the higher the number, the better. And here, I'm showing you some antibodies that are broad and very potent. Here, I'm showing you some antibodies that are less broad, you see these numbers are lower, but they are 500 times more potent. Really powerful antibodies. Now here I'm showing you an antibody called Teni8. It's extremely broad, it recognizes almost all viruses. Uh, but it's not very potent, it's up here. And what we can do is to engineer just a few mutations in the sequence of this antibody, and we end up with this. Extremely broad and extremely potent. What if we combine antibodies now? So these colored lines here are antibodies on their own, showing you their potency and their breadth of coverage. Now, if you combine two of these antibodies, and I'm showing you this is in vitro results. If you combine two antibodies, you get more breadth and more potency. Three antibodies, even more. Four antibodies, you get very potent, very high potency and great breadth. So you can engineer antibodies and you can combine antibodies to improve potency and breadth. Well, can this be done in vivo? Well, yeah. So this is a paper that came out from Michel Nussenzweig's lab uh, a few weeks ago. And what they did was to give two potent, broadly neutralizing antibodies in combination to 11 chronically suppressed <coughs> HIV positive people and then stopped antiretroviral therapy. And this is amazing. What they found was that the people who had virus that was sensitive to the broadly neutralizing antibodies remained suppressed for 15 to 30 weeks before virus came back. Okay, that's remarkable. And none of these people developed viruses that were resistant to both broadly neutralizing antibodies. So how can we make these antibodies last longer? Well, here is the antibody that I showed you at the beginning, VRC01. And what you can do is you can engineer two amino acid mutations in the FC part, FC binding part of the antibody, right? The constant tail of the antibody. Two amino acids. And you engineer these in to increase the half-life of the antibody because it's protected from degradation inside cells. So if you infuse the antibody into an individual, this is the concentration of the antibody. If you infuse the unmutated antibody, you can see that the concentration decreases pretty rapidly so that you would have to give another infusion here. This is the mutant antibody, VRCO1LF. This is amazing. A single 20 mg per kg infusion maintains therapeutic levels of greater than 50 milligrams per mil for six months. It's still above therapeutic levels. We don't actually know what the half-life is because we can't measure it because it's still there. So this decreases the dose that you need to give an individual five to tenfold, and it may extend the interval that you have to dose these people to maintain therapeutic levels to once every six months. Okay. So we can reduce reservoir size with early antiretroviral therapy. We can reduce the time to rebound when we stop, but it's not clinically significant. We're not going to win there. 
latency reversing agents show poor reactivation and no reduction in reservoir size. I think it's time to stop that. Therapeutic vaccines show some effects in monkeys, but in humans it is debatable whether they work. I am not hopeful about that. Checkpoint blockade looks interesting. Uh, the early results are inconsistent, but there are many, many trials planned. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation works once. It is not scalable, but it gives us a very important proof of concept. Gene therapy may be used to target HIV and or CTR5, and clinical studies in humans and monkeys show some reservoir reduction. However, delivery, delivery and scalability remain a concern. But you know, we'll make progress in that. An envelope-specific monoclonal antibodies are in promising proof of concept studies with more potent monoclonals, combinations of monoclonals, and long half-life monoclonals being developed. So as I said before, combination therapy may be necessary. And indeed, in the SIV macaque model in the monkeys, combination therapy seems to work. So this is a combination of a vaccine and a LRA, a TLR7 agonist, lowers virus load after therapy interruption. And here's a broadly neutralizing antibody combined with a TLR7 agonist. So these combinations yield sustained remission in macaques after therapy interruption. And I'm gonna leave you with this. This is a combination approach that is being planned in humans at University of San Francisco in California. And it's a real combination. So it's gonna begin with a DNA vaccine prime, a DNA vaccine boost, a viral vaccine boost, then broadly neutralizing antibodies with a latency reversing agent, a TLR9 agonist is gonna be given to boost the immune response and broadly neutralizing antibodies to bind um, in combination to bind virus, followed by a therapy interruption with combination broadly neutralizing antibodies. All right, they're throwing the contents of the refrigerator at these people. The study population will be people with chronically treated HIV disease. And the outcome will be viral load set point after therapy interruption. So I know I started off and I depressed you a little bit, but hopefully I've, I've lifted your spirits um, because I'm hopeful that we'll have some, some success in this arena. Um, thank you all for your attention.